Hi there, my name is Jason Harlow and today's pre-class video will take you through uh, Wolfson chapter 4 sections 4.1 to 4.4. Okay, and the sections are uh, Newton's first law and Newton's second law. Section 4.3 is on the four, uh, the, sorry, the three fundamental forces of nature and section 4.4 is on the force of gravity. And the little quote of the day here is uh, what keeps things moving is the wrong question. Galileo declared that the question needs no answer. So, oh, for example, there goes a arrow flying through the air. I'm glad it uh, missed me there, but um, they used to ask the question, if an arrow is flying through the air, what is the force that's pushing it along to keep it moving? Turns out uh, there doesn't need to be a force. Um, in fact, if there's any forces on it, any air resistance, if anything, is slowing it down. And if there were no air, and if there were no friction or resistive forces, an object in motion would stay in motion uh, forever. Okay, so we just mentioned Galileo. Uh, there's a picture of Galileo. Uh, it says on Wikipedia, Galileo, uh, born in 1564, died 1642, was an Italian astronomer, physicist, engineer, and philosopher, and mathematician. All those things... Um, he was uh, widely regarded as one of the greatest scientists of all time, and he's been called the father of modern science. Uh, the idea is that before Galileo, um, I guess Aristotle started this idea that if you just thought hard enough, you could figure out everything you needed to know um, about the universe. But what Galileo did is he started with observations and experiments. He kept detailed notes and did little experiments and looked at the universe and then after looking at all his notes and after he collected a bunch of data tried to come up with explanations that matched the data. And one of the things Galileo spent a lot of time doing was rolling marbles on inclines. So he found that he took a ball or a marble rolling down a piece of wood that was an incline it would pick up speed. Slope downward, the speed was increasing. If you took the same ball and gave it an initial speed up the hill, then as it was rolling up the hill, it's, it would lose its speed, it would slow down. So he sort of inferred from those two that the halfway point, if there was zero slope, that would be a case where a ball would just roll at the same speed forever. So, and if it did come to rest, Galileo inferred that that's not because of its nature, but it was due to some friction forces between the ball and the surface. So uh, the friction force would be some kind of a net force. A net force is a combination of all the forces that change an object's uh, state of motion. So, for example, if you pull on a box with five newtons, and a friend pulls on the same box, in the same direction, also with 5 newtons, then you'd say the net force is 10 newtons in the direction that you're both pulling. Okay. Uh, if you're both pulling opposite directions, both with 5 newtons, then those forces can cancel and you can end up with a net force of 0. So Newton's first law is that if an, a body in uniform motion remains in uniform motion and a body must at rest remains in rest unless acted on by a non-zero net force. So if that net force is zero, then the object will either stay at rest or it will continue to move at a constant velocity. And there's, there's a little picture there of the uh, Voyager spacecraft which has now left the solar system and is just moving through interstellar space at a constant velocity. And there's no net force on the, on the Voyager and that's why it just continues to, to clock along. So here's a question for you. Uh, a horizontal tabletop is shown here from above and there's a curved barrier that exerts a force on a ball that guides its motion in a circular path. After the ball leaves the barrier, which of the dash paths shown, A, B, or C, does it follow? So take a pause, uh, pause the video, think about it, and then, and then proceed. Okay, hopefully you figured out it's B. The idea there is that the ball, at any instant of time, has a velocity which is tangent to this circular path. 
So, and that velocity keeps changing because there's a continuous force from the curved barrier. But right where the barrier ends, the last velocity that the ball has, this tangent, is tangent to that circle. And once there's no force, since we're looking down from above, it will continue at that velocity uh, in the B direction. Okay, so we know about net force. Next concept is momentum. Momentum is a property of moving things, and we have a definition in physics of momentum is mass times velocity. Uh, the units there are uh, put down units. It's kilograms times meters per second. Okay, this is the SI units. Uh, the uh, equation in symbolic form, we use the symbol P for momentum. The little arrow above the P means that it's a vector. Equals M, which is a scalar, times V. V is the velocity vector. And so, for example, this GO train moving along has a very large amount of momentum. And you better get out of the way if it's coming right towards you. So Newton's second law of motion is that the rate at which a body's momentum changes is equal to the net force that is acting on the body. So uh, the rate something changes is, is the derivative, time derivative, d by dt, of p equals the net force. So that's the way Isaac Newton wrote it down in his Principia book long ago. Uh, another mathematically equivalent form, if you take the uh, definition of momentum, take the derivative, the mass is not changing, you get that the acceleration is equal to the net force divided by the mass. So this is actually the form of Newton's second law that I prefer to think about uh, because it's, it's kind of intuitive, right? If you have a single object, mass doesn't change, but you double the net force, that's going to double the acceleration. However, if you keep the same net force and you just double the mass of an object, that's going to cut down the acceleration by a factor of two. And uh, the way they show it in the book is if you have an empty truck and you exert some particular force on it, it's going to accelerate at some uh, sort of large rate. But if you fill up the truck, increase its mass, and apply the same force, its acceleration will be less. Okay, next concept in this chapter is called inertial reference frames. So it turns out that these Newton's laws, like Newton's first law, for example, is only valid in reference frames that are not accelerating. So we have a special word for that. A reference frame that, not, that is not accelerating is called an inertial reference frame. Example, uh, a physics student is standing in uh, an airplane that's cruising along at a constant velocity. And there's a ball on the floor, and the ball just stays at the person's foot, um, so it doesn't seem to accelerate. So we would say uh, that that airplane is an inertial reference frame. I guess this is this is Newton's first law that there's no doesn't there's no net force on the ball, so uh, it doesn't accelerate. However, a physics student for some reason is standing up the, in an airplane that is accelerating during takeoff. We all know that if you're accelerating, the whole plane's accelerating towards the right. You look at that ball, it's going to roll towards the back of the airplane, and it's going to accelerate. So this is a case where there's no net force on the ball, and yet it's accelerating towards the back of the plane. So uh, the reason there is, so that's Newton's first law is violated there. So we would say that the airplane is not an inertial reference frame, and that's because the airplane is accelerating. So let's do a quick uh, question here for you, just to see if you're keeping up. An object moves with a constant velocity in a straight line. Which of the statements is true? Is there no forces acting on the object? B, the net force on the object is zero. C, there's a constant force in the direction of motion. Or D, there's a constant force in the direction opposite to the motion. Think about that. Okay. Uh, the answer there is that there's the net force on the object is zero. So there could be forces acting on them, but the, s the vector sum of all those forces has to be zero. And then the object will move at a constant velocity. Okay, next is what is a force? So uh, 
a force is a push or a pull on an object and there's two kinds of forces you can have contact forces like the bat touching the ball that's going to push it uh, in this direction and uh, there's also long range forces such as the force of gravity so a falling cup is being pulled towards the center of the earth even though the center of the earth isn't actually touching the cup so in physics uh, we've recognized that there's actually three fundamental forces and they are gravity uh, what's called the strong force and what's called the electroweak force uh, and all all forces fall under these three categories and it turns out that nearly every all everyday forces uh, such as bats hitting balls or pushing on a wall or tension or something these are all electromagnetic forces so they're actually the electric force between the uh, the outer electrons in uh, in neighboring objects there's a, electricity and magnetism are combined to form what's called the electromagnetic force uh, and then there's another force called the weak force which is important in in some nuclear reactions it turns out electromagnetism and weak force uh, have been combined to be uh, all actually just described by the electroweak force um, so far physicists have not combined the strong and the and gravity and electroweak but there's an idea that someday we will so a goal of physics is to unify all the forces in some theory of everything Okay, so lastly, we're going to talk about weight, um, mass, weight, and gravity. So the definition of weight is it is the force of gravity acting on an object. And it turns out that that's equal to the mass of the object times g. Okay, Mass is some property of any object which depends on how much stuff is in it. And it doesn't depend on the presence of gravity or even the strength of gravity. But weight does depend on gravity, and so it varies with location different planets would have different values of g. Okay, so g here on Earth has a magnitude of 9.8 meters per second squared or equivalently 9.8 newtons per kilogram directed downward. So if you've got a mass of one kilogram it's going to have a weight of 9.8 newtons uh, in the downward direction. So quick question for you. If you were to move to the moon uh, would your mass change or would your weight change? Uh, you can read those uh, multiple choice quest, uh, answers and press pause and then proceed. Okay, hopefully you picked B. Your weight would change, it would decrease actually, but your mass would not. Okay, so weightlessness. So here's an example of being in an elevator, if you can imagine it. This is a thought experiment. Uh, and the, suddenly the rope breaks. So the elevator starts accelerating downwards at 9.8 meters per second squared. Well, if you dropped a, a book at that same instant, it would accelerate downwards at 9.8 meters per second squared. So in the frame of the elevator, uh, you would just see the book just hovering beside you. So this is weightlessness. You, or, or, sorry, this is apparent weightlessness. The book looks like it's just floating there, and so and you actually feel weightless. Um, even though you're not, even though there is a force of gravity that, that is accelerating you towards the Earth. Now, if you're in a spacecraft like the International Space Shuttle and Space Station, uh, you're accelerating in your orbit around the Earth. And it turns out that you're accelerating at just the exact rate of the acceleration due to gravity in at your altitude, whatever it is, which is not much less than 9.8, actually. So if you were to let go of a book, it would accelerate downwards towards the center of the Earth at maybe 8.5 meters per second squared, depending on how high up you are. And you and your whole spacecraft is also accelerating downwards. And so, once again, the book appears to hover there, and you're experiencing apparent weightlessness. So that's it for this video, and I will see you in class.